as I've been preparing for this course, one of the things I've come across is this extraordinary book written by a woman named Laura Otis. And it's really a work of history. It's a remarkable bit of history, but it includes some biology as well. And you may remember that I mentioned in my talk about Matthias Schleiden that he had spent some time in a lab of Johannes Müller. Johannes Müller was a catalyst, an extraordinary catalyst for a number of the major figures in both anatomy and early cell biology or so early cellular mechanisms. According to this book, he had a thousand students go through his lectures and through his uh, material over his life, which is pretty, pretty impressive. He ended up being a stimulus and a very active participant in the research of this remarkable group of people. So we talked last time about Matthias Schleiden. Uh, today, we're going to talk mostly about Theodor Schwann. But then there are these others, Virchow, who we'll talk about next week, probably in association with Robert Rimach, who was a very interesting figure in the whole thing. Jakob Henley um, is somewhat less of a figure in, in the path that I think I want to draw, though I may end up mentioning his work. You may know him as an anatomist because there are things with his name on them, like there's a structure in the kidney called Henley's loop, which he identified. Most of these people were following the work of Miller, who was a physiologist, mostly. He published an extraordinary book that was the Bible, if you will, of physiological studies for a great deal of the 19th century. And at the same time, he pushed his students to do anatomical and microscopical studies, quite a bit of microscopical studies. And we'll get into some of that with Schwann today. Now, one of the interesting points that Otis makes in her book right at the beginning is that there really wasn't exactly a lab that is a physical laboratory space that was Miller's lab into which people went. These are sort of fixed laboratories with specialized equipment all set up for use. From what Otis has been able to gather, most of the research itself was done in little corners of either the places where these people were living or in small corners set aside within the institution that was the, the Berlin academic institution in which they worked. So in the sense of a formal laboratory, this is almost a, a joke. So she left off the quotes, but I'll put them in. Okay, so that's enough to get started now to start thinking about Theodor Schwann, who turns out to have been a, both a major figure in the history of our understanding of cells, but also a kind of a remarkable figure in the history of science. So let's, let's dig into what we know about Theodor Schwann. For reasons that may become obvious later on, He's always being introduced as being a devout Catholic. And he was a devout Catholic. He came from a family of 14 children. But at the same time, he struggled with his religion in a certain way. And you'll see how that comes up as, as we continue. It also affected his employment and where he was able to work. So we'll cover some of those features although not as much as in Otis's book. Otis is full of the ramifications and the history of who went where and who struggled with whom for which position as a professor in which institution. That's less interesting for me. What I'm more interested in 
is to get a sense of the intellectual path. So as it turns out, he worked at the University of Bonn originally and met Miller there, and then took training as a physician and then eventually moved to the University in Berlin, which Miller was, which is where Miller had set up his uh, laboratory, if you will. Okay. And so Schwann worked with Miller and was involved with Miller's work until 1839. And it turns out that's when most of his research was done. So we're going to maybe come back and think about that a little bit. At the same time, you may recall from last lecture that Matthias Schleiden was also in that lab facility or in that cluster of students. And so Schwann became friends with Schleiden and they knew each other, even though they sort of wandered off in very different directions, they retained an association and, and you'll see about that shortly. At any rate, in 1839, Schwann left Berlin because he couldn't get a position in Berlin, which he was actually interested in, and ended up becoming first the professor of anatomy at the University of Louvain, which is in Belgium. And that's a Catholic university. Notice these things playing through. And then uh, 10 years later, he moved to the University of Liège, also in Belgium, and also a Catholic university. So they're, they're interesting themes that we may touch upon and, and may not. This can get very, very complicated if we start looking at the religious attachments and the various associations of the different scientists we're talking about. Some of it will come up, but I, it's going to be a kind of a minor theme as it shows up in the course. What's interesting about Schwann, among other things, is that the work that he did was absolutely remarkable in many different areas. So I'm going to start by talking about the thing we really don't mention much, was that he was responsible for identifying the first stomach enzyme, the first digestive enzyme, which was pepsin. And here's the way the story developed. There are, I have two pages to show you on this thing. First, let me tell you what we now know. And what we now know is that there are basically two cell types in the stomach. One is called the parietal cell and one is called the chief cell. Okay. And one of them, the parietal cell, is responsible for secreting the hydrochloric acid that was clearly well known to be in the stomach. By that time, in the mid 19th century, you may recall from some other form of history, although this generally shows up in a, uh, more in a, a physiology course, man by the man name of Beaumont. Beaumont, who was an American, and worked during the uh, Civil War. Okay. And Beaumont was presented with a patient who had somehow suffered a wound, presumably in battle, in which his abdomen was torn open. And in some peculiar way, his stomach lining became fused with the, with the skin of the outside of his abdomen. So that he ended up, let's see if I can create a side view of something that's a little strange to think about. Okay, so if here is his stomach. Sorry to draw this peculiar vision of a man. Okay, his stomach in some way connected 
Then it went on to the rest of the internal stuff. But there was a little opening in his stomach so that it was possible for Beaumont to actually add food, give him something to eat or deposit food in the stomach and ask what happened to it and assay what was in there. And what Beaumont found was that there was this incredibly acidic environment. And so then it became interesting to ask, was it possible that this acid su was sufficient enough to digest the food that was going in there? And it turned out that it ended up being several people, you can see their names up here, Tiedemann, Mellon, Everly, who actually tried to figure this out who looked to make sure to check this acidity and then realized that, and this is where we get to what Schwann did. Schwann actually extracted the juices, not from a person anymore, but from uh, an ox. And he first shows that hydrochloric acid alone can't dissolve the protein. And so he thinks of several ways that it might happen. That maybe what it is, is that it does somehow act as a solvent, allowing something else to digest the material. It can combine chemically with something else so that the compound itself is now able to digest protein. It could dissolve the products it could decompose itself, the acid, in order to combine with digest the products, or it could somehow predispose the products to decomposition without itself decomposing. And so Schwann goes through all of these procedures and he ends up showing that in fact, there's an unknown digestive factor that interacts, that interacts with the acid. So he says there is an unknown digestive factor. He then goes on to say that this is found within the stomach lining, within the cells of the stomach. And he then talks about whether this is anything like fermentation and basically says probably not. Okay, now let me go back to this picture and point out that what, what we now understand is that the parietal cells generate, secrete the acid. And the chief cells secrete a protein which is now called pepsinogen, which is by low pH. So it's a two factor thing and he basically had worked this out pretty well. So that's that was sort of the first of his major contributions. The reason that the text is shown this way, this is a copy from Otis's book, is that the data were presented in two papers. One paper specifically shared with Miller and the other is more specifically the paper by Schwann. And she points out in, the, in her analysis that Schwann's approach to presenting research was rather different. He was not as distant that he actually involved himself in the research. And he presented it in a way that sort of guided people through his logical 
process, which I think is, is really kind of neat. So that's one of the things we associate with Schwann. He then was involved early on, interestingly enough, with investigating the process of fermentation. Well, of course, you know, this is Germany and he's interested in beer. But the basic idea, that's a nasty crack. It's actually Prussia at that point. But what he was doing was he was trying to demonstrate that the thing that caused fermentation was actually yeast. So this is why he ends up saying, first, we have every proof that these fermentation granules are fungi, which means they're type of yeast. Their form is that they consist of cells, many of which seem to have small ones. They grow by putting out new cells, they propagate. And then he shows that if you, let's see, if they, yeah, if you heat the material that they're in, if you boil it, you stop fermentation. And if you heat the air above the chamber in which this is going on, that prevents anything from falling into it that causes fermentation. So the argument is that it comes specifically from the yeast that are within the ferment mix. So then here's a wonder, I describes this wonderful experiment. I just kind of love the idea of how he puts things together. He takes a tong, long test tube like this. He puts in the yeast with a very small amount and lets it settle to the bottom. He then fills this with a liquid containing stuff you may remember from old lab work called litmus. Remember litmus? And litmus, which is in this case the litmus test, starts out blue and becomes red in the presence of acid. And so what he shows is that in this report, at least, he says, once you set it up like this, it starts to be red at the bottom rather than all the way up. And that's because this is where the yeast are. If, he says, you put a glass rod in here, some sort of glass rod, then the redness, because the yeast can, can sort of sit on the rod, then the redness happens throughout the tube. I think that's a remarkable kind of demonstration. At any rate, this is an example of the way that he carries out an experiment and talks about it. The, the language, now this is all in translation, but I do get the sense that the translations are in, in pretty good shape for this. So he actually made a case. Now, this whole argument about fermentation was not accepted very easily by people. And in fact, it took a good 10 years or more for Pasteur to make the same observations and confirm all of this. And then Pasteur was the one who now gets credit for arguing that fermentation came about through yeast. There is a letter that exists now from Pasteur to Schwann in which Pasteur basically says, you know, I've really just been following in your footsteps. Thank you very much for your contributions. Very nice. So people do are aware of each other and working with it. The other interesting component, and I'm, I'm somewhat jumping ahead with this because this comes out of his major book or the major product, but I wanted to emphasize one little part of it before we do, and that is, based on some work that was done by Remak, by Henley, he started to look at nerve tissues. And among the nerves that he looked at, he looked at, these are, if I try to read this thing properly, nervous fibrous, fiber from the vagus nerve of a calf. And what he found 
is that if you take those nerves, that's what this is, and sort of compress them out or do something like that to squeeze them out, to flatten them a little bit, what you would see is this dark line around the edges, which he called various things. Some people are now referring to it as the Schwann sheath. But he also showed, and it's in this picture here, but a little harder to see. So I'll enlarge it here. He showed a cell as part of this thing. And that cell is what we now refer to as the Schwann cell. And that's the one that's involved in elaborating the myelin that surrounds peripheral nerves. It's a type of glial cell. The details of, of myelin formation we may actually get to later on in the course. So you can see that there's a kind of a range to the interest that Schwann has. One, one of the other things, and I can do it here as well as I can point it out later on, is you'll notice his, his cell has a dense nucleus in it. And within the nucleus, here's a good example of that. Within the nucleus is a denser structure, which he calls the nucleolus, his term. And so that becomes an important characteristic of what he is then going to show us. All right. So here we get this wonderful little narrative. Um, apparently, he described this sometime later. So it's not clear exactly you know, how, how reliable the story is. But the basic idea is, as you see, he and, Schwa he and Schleiden used to get together in Berlin every now and then to have long conversations. They were not in the same institution. They were in separate places, but they'd meet and get together and have lunch or dinner. And apparently he said that when they were having dinner, Schleiden said, you know, he's been looking at this thing that there are nuclei in all the cells of the plant that he looks at. That there's something general about plant cells and their nuclei. Now, you may remember, I may have mentioned this in the last lecture, that one of the things that Schleiden did indeed point out is that every time you look at the cells of a plant, you can resolve it into cells, each of which has a nucleus. And so Schwann is saying here, so we had this interesting discussion. And as part of the discussion, Schwann says, Suddenly, I like the suddenly, I remembered having seen a similar structure in cells of the corda dorsalis. What's the corda dorsalis? The corda dorsalis is the notochord of an embryonic frog, I think was what he was looking at. And then he said, so look, if I saw something like this in the uh, notochord of an animal, then wait a minute, maybe there's something common to this between the plants and the animals. And so he wasn't so sure about that, but he thought, gee, that's very important. And notice he says something about it negates this idea of a vital force that's unique to animals. And we'll, we'll get to that in another minute. But the idea was that there was something unique about animals that distinguished them from plants. And that one of these things was something you might call a vital force. And as I said, we'll get to this a little bit more. So anyway, he says, I invited Schleiden to come with me and we, we'll go take a look at the nuclei in the Corda dorsalis cells. And he agreed, same thing that, I, that he had seen in plants. 
what Schwann did when he published this work, he included in it a copy of the paper that Schleiden had written in which he, Schleiden, demonstrated that all the, uh, that the plants consisted essentially all of cells. So that what emerged from this document was the combined effort of both Schleiden and Schwann to put this together. This is the way he started writing it up in a book which is called Contributions to the Anatomy of Animals and Plants. What I'm trying to do is present something of the sense of how he actually writes about these things. He says, so here's where we have a challenge. He says, animals seem to have a much greater variety of form than in the vegetables. I mean, the plants are, you know, boring. And there's much more development, much more complexity in their individual tissues. And look at the difference between a muscle and a nerve between some sorts of tissues and others, between, he says, nerve tissue and cellular tissue. And he says, by the time we start looking at all of them, this is the, the point that he wants to make for this thing, is that, in fact, all of these forms in both animals and plants derive, let's see the best place to put it, originate only from cells, okay? And that these cells are completely analogous to those of vegetables. He said the design, now this is in his introduction. So he says the design of the present treatise is to prove this by a series of observations. Well, 300 pages later, he's basically made that case. And what he's done is accumulate a significant library of all of these various cells that he's looked at. So here's an example. Once again, as in the last lecture, I took the pages from the book and rotated them so I could fit them into this axis so that the long pictures show up here. So just to give you a little bit of a guidance in here, this, This is number one, basically cell tissue with nuclei from an onion. Remember I mentioned last week something about onion skin, and this is probably what he's looking at. And then the part of the issue is that the way these figures are labeled, they don't, they're not always the logical ones that come through, but here we have for figure two, which is this one, some pollen with nuclei in them. And again, you can see he's always drawing the nuclei with nucleoli. And then he goes ahead and he says here, number four, which is this group. are cells from this, this notochord, the corda dorsalis, which is the, the cord in the back. And he shows the same thing. Now, wait a minute. How did he see these kinds of cells? I mean, this is, this is the sort of thing that isn't as clearly explained throughout the book, or at least I haven't been able to dig deep enough into the book to find it all. But basically what he would do is take this tissue, whatever tissue it has, and scrape off a little bit of it so that he could then look at it flattened in the microscope with the, with the microscope slide. We'll probably want to talk, not in this lecture, but later on a bit, to talk about the microscopes that he was using. We sort of laid the groundwork by talking about Lister and the achromatic, aspherical lenses. But there's, there is some interesting history to that, and I'll, I'll probably get to that in the next lecture. But at any rate, 
this was the, the conclusion that he drew, then going through one cell type after another, and this is what the next couple of plates are. And it, it's really just to see something of, imagine the work that it takes to generate each of these separate images, each of these separate things, when you don't have a camera. And what you're actually doing here is trying to extract from the material that you see the essence of what you're looking at. It also means you have to be an extremely careful person to copy over the essence of what you're looking at. And so generally what people would do is they would invite others to look with them and they would see if they were able to really confirm exactly what they were seeing. This material over here in figure nine are um, pigment cells that come from the tail of a tadpole. Okay, that's this group over here. And even in things like this, which have such a different shape from those almost cuboidal cells that he was looking at before. He can still make out the nucleus. And in some cases include what he would say is the nucleolus. And he also tries to distinguish between some of the granular material that you see in tissues like this one, which are sort of uh, mucus layered cells, that there's a lot of material in here that is not the nucleus. And you have to sort of hunt around to find it within these cells. And I'll give you one more of these just to sort of fill this in, to show that, again, that sense that he is looking at many, many different tissue types to try to build this case that in fact, the cells are a common feature, even if their structure changes again and again. So now we get into this very interesting challenge that he comes up with. And it comes out this way. There's a philosophical problem. And remember, I mentioned the idea of vitalism. And vitalism, was a suggestion, was a, th a theory that was pretty strong in the, uh, in the 19th century, that there was a special force that you, would, that you would associate with things being alive. And that this vital force was what drove the material, the cells together to form the structure. It drove it in its behavior. And depending on how complicated the animal was, there were people who actually extended this idea of vitalism to what you would now call a soul. So the individual structure within a living being that controls its existence, that controls its force, that is responsible for its growth and its behavior. And this is the core of this idea of vitalism. Now, for Schwann, the idea that there was a common structure to all cells, to all living organisms. If all living organisms consist of cells, then you don't really have to say that there is something special about any one of the particular living organisms or some special living force that in fact everything that you see could come up as a result of similar processes. And so the this cell theory so far, which is that all organisms are composed of cells. That's basically what it is, that there are cells that make up all the tissues of all organisms. And that the growth and the behavior of the uh, organism is due to the behavior of those cells. So then you get into this very interesting kind of thought from 
Schwann, remembering that he's a devout Catholic. And it isn't that he's a Catholic, but that he has a devout faith. And so he said, and you can juggle this any way you like, that there is no need for a life force when God himself has given this power to the cells themselves. So whatever the original source of this power is, these cells are now functioning on their own. But it does acknowledge the presence of a physical, of a separate being that gives them all the impetus to function. So you don't need necessarily the, this idea of a rational being, but you do need God himself to set it going. Well, that's a bit kind of challenging for anybody to juggle through their philosophy, but that is what he was trying to do. So one more thing about Schwann's approach and to some extent Schleiden, both Schleiden and Schwann had a mistaken idea of how cells multiplied. You remember that I told you last time that Schleiden had become very interested in what he called the cytoblast. which as the best I can understand was a swelling around the nucleus that eventually, so there was no idea in this that the nucleus itself duplicated, although you would think that should be obvious. Schwann, on the other hand, was particularly caught up with this idea that physical forces could account of life. And so, he tried the formation of new cells by, and this is kind of a stretch based on his real interests in, in what he saw, but he considered it to be a sort of a crystalline effect, rather like the growth of crystals. So, you know, with all of this contribution, there are still some things that are not fully understood in the way this plays out. And there's one more thing I'd like to mention before I, I call this to an end. And let's go back and look again at his life. All of these papers that had to do with pepsin, that had to do with these ideas of spontaneous generation, on the role of yeast, on the Schwann cells, and on cell theory, all of that material happened to him or emerged from him within a seven, seven or eight year period from, from here to here. All of this while he was associated with Miller. 
And then he left to go to Louvain and then to go to Liège. And depending on whose work you read, his productivity dropped off enormously. Now, there's a, there are some questions about how much it really dropped off, but he certainly contributed fewer and fewer observations of this sort. Remember where, where Schleiden became a sort of a public lecturer and gave these large lectures to large audiences about his observations. Swan seemed to be more involved in his work in, the, in these universities, specifically giving lectures on either anatomy or then physiology, but not ex expanding enormously more. That's one story. The other side of this story is that Schwann had a, an ability which we really didn't discuss yet, but every, everybody that comments on him points out that he was a wonderful tinkerer. He was a man who developed lots and lots of interesting bits of equipment. One of the things he did, for instance, was he showed that he made a chamber in which there was no oxygen or no air. And he showed that a chick egg would not develop in the absence of air. But he had to make the chamber and evacuate it. He was known for making some of the physiological apparatus that was used, not necessarily by him, but also by Miller and others. So he was a complicated person there's some suggestion that he went through a religious crisis at the end of all this work, where I suggested that there was something he was struggling with after the development of the cell theory and what its implications were for his faith, which were indeed very, very deep. So this all together means that there's a, from my mind at least, there's a kind of a mystery about Schwann and what happened to him by the, you know, once he finished this extraordinary burst of creativity. So that's about as far as I do want to take it today. Next time, we'll keep going with this history.